Boom, there's a good thumbnail. Go live. Uh, you're live, okay. Do you want me to do anything? No, we're just gonna, it, it'll just play. Uh, That's taping as well, recording too, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's live. I saw you it can hear you now. <laughs> it can hear all of us. Yeah, yeah, but it will end up cutting it up. <laughs> Once it's live, it's live. <laughs> all right, there you go. Let me tweet it out. I got one in another one. So I'd like to take some moment to introduce about Code Banka first. So we are an ID community. We have some co-learners, have some experience of software developers and some junior developers they are learning programming. We also have people like blockchain is such a new technology. You don't have that much developers. So they are actually learning how to develop a blockchain themselves. And we also is kind of like a freelance agency. We have project people working. Uh, building a blockchain uh, is like Skyinfo, Skycom, this company, they use our service to help them. And we also have uh, many tech events like this one uh, to talk about the latest industry chain and hope that we can give you some of the uh, latest information about uh, IT business. And today we have Matthew from Iron to talk about uh, his project on the first generation of blockchain. So I let him take the stage. And please, thank you. Thank you. And this is Chris, by the way. Round of applause for Chris. <laughs> um, so before we get started, uh, Chris is going to be helping me on parts of the presentation when we get into some of the roadmap items on, on the tech. But also, I'm going to be speaking in English, and if there's anybody who has any questions while I'm going, feel free to interrupt and put your hand up. And if you have a question in Chinese, also feel free to interrupt and put your hand up. Uh, Chris is perfectly bilingual and loves to go through that stuff with you guys. So a um, little bit of introduction on who I am. Uh, my name is Matthew Spoke. I'm the founder of a project called Aeon. Um, most of us are based in Toronto, Canada, uh, but increasingly we're starting to put some teams kind of around the world. In fact, part of our reason for being here in Shanghai is to uh, to start hire a team here, start to hire. So we opened an office uh, this week uh, and started doing interviews this week. So probably in the next uh, few weeks, we'll start having an engineering team on the ground here in Shanghai. Um, you know, for those of you who are interested, I used to live here as well, but that's less interesting. Um, anyways, so the project that we built, uh, Aeon, is is a blockchain protocol that we're going to tell you a little bit more about. Uh, the company's been around for about two years in Toronto. Uh, I've been in the industry for about four years working on. Um, infrastructure, uh, blockchain infrastructure from the enterprise market originally, uh, where we started a, a blockchain team at a, at a big consulting firm called Deloitte. Uh, and then we kind of migrated that into a company focused on how do you build scalable blockchain systems 
as more and more companies around the world were interested in what this technology meant to their business and what decentralization might mean to uh, traditionally centralized business models and centralized authorities. Uh, so we're really passionate about what, what, this, uh, what this means for the future, uh, what this technology might mean to other industries as well. We see blockchains as a really uh, fundamental change in how we build the core layer of, of IT systems. Uh, so whether you work in, in IoT or you work in, uh, in robotics or, or you work in just kind of basic web-based technologies, we think that blockchains are going to be fundamental to all of those industries. And, and I'll, we'll kind of walk you through why. Uh, but the challenge that we're facing today as an industry is that uh, we have a lot more um, maturation to do. We have a lot more infrastructure to build. It's, uh, we're kind of at that stage where we, we kind of compare ourselves to like 1993 internet technology. And there's tons of people out there with great ideas of what types of applications you might be able to build. Um, but, you know, back to that analogy, it'd be like trying to build Netflix in 1993. Um, there's just a whole bunch of challenges that have yet to be solved. Challenges around scaling these systems, allowing more data to be processed and transactions to be processed. And in increasingly important today is challenges around what we call interoperability. Um, so a little bit of, a, of context and background on uh, who we are and what we're focusing on. Um, this is kind of a basic idea of like how blockchain protocols in our mind fit into the market today. You generally find three categories of blockchain projects. Uh, where we used to operate and where there's still a lot of companies operating today is in this first category of like private enterprise solutions. So I know we've got uh, uh, somebody in the room with us, Eric's here from IBM. Lots of big companies like IBM, like JP Morgan, um, like Deloitte, um, like Accenture and Intel have been working in this category around how do we build enterprise versions of these systems for better collaboration. Um, and there's been a ton of activity around this probably since about 2015. So this, this trend started picking up in 2015. Public systems is probably the origination of this industry, obviously. Blockchains started because of Bitcoin. Chains, famous ones like Ethereum, and also tons and tons of kind of small ones that make up a really, really long tail of blockchains. If you really look into the market, you probably find that there are actively a few hundred live operating blockchain public sites various private networks here. And finally, increasingly today, in 2017 particularly, there's been projects focusing on the, on the challenges of interoperability. So we see this as a big problem because um, there are what we consider to be hundreds of blockchains today uh, in live production use, probably thousands in testing and proof of concept mode, and in the future, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of blockchains. And probably these things become as ubiquitous as databases are behind most companies' systems today. And if that's the case, then all of a sudden we have a big challenge of how do we make sure that communication can occur between these systems, whether they're designed the same way or not. Uh, and you know, when you, when you look at different protocols like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you, know, you ask yourself the question, how can I do a Bitcoin transaction in such a way that Ethereum as a network could recognize it? And the simple answer today is you can't. And that's why centralized exchanges have been built and people trade through centralized intermediaries, which is quite ironic in an industry that talks about decentralization, right? So we've essentially built massive, massive financial institutions that look a lot like banks in an industry that started off by saying we don't need banks, right? So um, we're starting to solve for some of these problems. How do you move data and value between different blockchains? And there's a, there's a number of businesses kind of working in this industry on this particular problem. Many of us collaborating with each other to kind of share best practices and knowledge and research uh, we launched a few months ago something called the Blockchain Interoperability Alliance with a few other projects. Uh, one Chinese one particular, particularly well known in Beijing called Wanchain, and another one from South Korea called Icon. But, uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that as well. Um, so that's where we started focusing on how do we build Aon? What should be the design principles behind the Aon system? So for those, so the, the high level way to think about it is Aon is a public blockchain system. But it's a public blockchain system that has a couple of unique characteristics. One, it's an operating system in the same way that Ethereum considers itself an operating system. You can use it to build applications and, and, and deploy logic and run business processes on top of this, this, this operating system that acts as a decentralized network. Secondly, though, we, we've designed it to kind of act as a router. A router in the sense that we see it sitting as a hub in the middle of many, many blockchains such that data can be transmitted through this router from one blockchain to another. And then thirdly, we see it kind of as the TCP IP equivalent in our industry, where we need a common language, a common mechanism for people to know if a message leaves blockchain number one, will blockchain number two be able to interpret that message in such a way that it can consume it? 
Uh, and so that's where we kind of act as the interpretation layer inside this network of many blockchains. In some cases, people call these things the internet of blockchains. Uh, we, we tend to talk about the decentralized internet, meaning we see the internet eventually getting re-architected towards decentralized value systems. Uh, and part of our philosophy at Aon is that, you know, for all of the promises of the internet, many of which have come through, come true over the last 30 years, the reality is, is that the internet started as a promise of decentralized communication and turned into a reality of centralized communication. If you live in China, you probably communicate through one system, WeChat. If you live in Canada, you probably uh, actively use the internet through interfaces like Google. We've built the internet around probably 10 to 20 massive, massive centralized intermediaries. And we think that there's a better architecture for the internet. We think that this is the types of technologies that need to get built to re-architect the internet from scratch. Um, so with that in mind, I think um, these next few slides kind of reiterate what I just said, so I'll skip through that. Oh, scalability is, is obviously, actually, let me double check. Um, so private and public, when we started thinking about this, we realized that the spectrum that used to be, well, if you're an enterprise, you're on this end of the spectrum. If you're a, a Bitcoin lover, you're on that end of the spectrum. We're realizing that that's actually starting to disappear. You're starting to see enterprises focusing on, on the public networks, and you're starting to see you know, public crypto people realize the importance of private networks for scale. So more and more, these are becoming kind of two versions of the same technology, not competitors. Uh, so what that means is from our design, we need to make sure that Aon can be deployed both as a public infrastructure as well as a private infrastructure and anything in the middle. So this is a, a spectrum of technologies rather than a single you know, winner take all. Um, and that really comes down to the mechanism and rules around what we call consensus. You know, These networks are all about how do many, many people on a network agree on information about that network, right? So Bitcoin, its consensus is such that everybody knows the state of a transaction at any given point in time. In a private network, you can define who are the participants that would be part of consensus. And we think that there's a whole bunch of layers of different mechanisms of consensus that we can enable inside the system. And the, the nice trade-off is that although decentralization leads to censorship resistance and better security and all these great features that the industry is really excited about, set, you know, you move kind of down the other end of the spectrum towards private blockchain systems and you can get better performance and better throughput and all these kind of scaling requirements that are going to be relatively critical for um, mainstream financial institutions and others. And that comes into like uh, scalability. How do we achieve consensus? How do we make sure that the virtual machines in these systems that are actually processing these transactions do so in an efficient way? And um, you know, not, not a criticism on the industry, it's just it, kind of the reality of any new industry. New ideas tend to emerge out of uh, relatively, um, you know, crazy thinkers that we all like to be. But in, in a lot of cases, the, the, the maturity of engineering follows five to 10 years later. And the way that the systems were originally built may not have been the most optimal way for them to have been built. And all of a sudden you need kind of years and years and years of engineering experience to think about what's the optimal way to design for things like transaction scale, transaction performance, you know, efficient consensus. And we think that that's something that is just starting to happen now in the industry where you're seeing really, really leading engineers from massive companies like Google and Alibaba and Facebook and IBM leave their traditional mainstream jobs to build blockchain systems because there's now something really appealing in this. Uh, and that's a positive indication for us. So, uh, and then finally interoperability, you know, this is where we start talking about what we call our, our bridge consensus uh, mechanism. But I'll, I'll let Chris get into that a little bit later. Um, so three things that we designed Aon with, uh, to do, and you know, this kind of lays out uh, from a design perspective, what do we want to be able to do on top of the AI network? One is what we call federation. And federation is the ability for a transaction to initiate on one network, but to arrive on another network. So what that means practically, if you're used to cryptocurrencies, that means how can I send a transaction on Ethereum that autonomously triggers a transaction on Bitcoin or vice versa, uh, or and, and any other network out there. Uh, and today, that concept is not possible. And transactions, just for context, most people can relate to the cryptocurrency aspect of this, but transactions in the blockchain world are actually any time you write any new data to a blockchain. So a transaction could be that I'm moving my balance from my wallet to Chris's wallet, and the transaction is that I'm changing the owner of that, that unit. But a transaction also could be that I'm adding information into a smart contract, for example. So anything that looks like an event, uh, a record of data, uh, all of these things are transactions. So um, there's a lot of cool use cases around why this becomes relevant. I'll give you an example in a minute. Scale is something that's uh, particularly, you know, becoming more and more obvious today if you look at public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, how many of you are familiar with um, with a system called CryptoKitties? Is that something that you're familiar yes. with? 
A few of you? <laughs> okay. So, so uh, Crypto Kitties, it just, it's, a, it's a silly example, but it's a, it's a very popular application that's built on Ethereum um, that became very, very kind of notorious last year, not because of what it is. And for those of you curious, Crypto Kitties, as it sounds, is a digital cat trading system where you can, you know, breed cats and trade cats and uh, have a unique cat. And the, the, the use of the blockchain is essentially to prove that your cat is authentic and in fact, yours. Um, you know, they just finished raising another $15 million uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, if, if you remember Tamagotchis that you used to have in your pocket, you know, these little egg things that you used to feed 10, 15 years ago, it's kind of the new Ethereum version of Tamagotchis. Massively, massively popular application in the Ethereum world. What's more interesting about it, though, is that that one app consumed 30% of the transaction volume on the Ethereum network and crashed the network for days. That if you were trying to process transactions while CryptoKitties was launching, your transaction got stuck for days at a time in a system that promises instantaneous finality and transaction processing and low fees. All of a sudden, the, the system became expensive and slow, and you may as well send your money through Western Union because Ethereum was not open for business during that period of time. So this demonstrated that scale was a massive problem. This is one app, and it's only an app for online cat lovers, and that's probably a pretty niche community. And But we're also talking about how do we build finance apps and and real estate apps and, and government apps, all of these things are going to be massively important and bigger than CryptoKitties. So if CryptoKitties breaks the network, what's the world's identity system going to do to the network? And that's where we started thinking about, well, how can we effectively scale so that transactions can be processed on more than one blockchain and then can be re-aggregated when they need to be re-aggregated? Because these systems, as cool as they are, are actually extremely inefficient. You've taken data that used to exist in one place and you replicated it in 10,000 places. That has cost, that has you know, data warehousing costs, it has computing costs, it has all sorts of like layers and layers and layers of inefficiency that didn't exist in databases that we kind of brought back in. So that inefficiency comes with the trade-off of like security and censorship resistance and all those great things. But we think that one of the solutions is actually to allow applications to scale over multiple blockchains. Um, and then finally, uh, in, in, in the kind of design of what we call a hub and spoke model, where you think of the core network as a hub and all of the networks that kind of sit around it as spokes in the same way that you would a wheel, um, you can now create blockchains that are more domain oriented or vertically focused. You, know, you can create a blockchain that is supply chain focused or, or domestic finance in one country or healthcare focused within a single province where hospitals may need to collaborate on a single network. So all of a sudden you can start to create these very, very specific blockchains that still need to talk to each other because, you know, one of the examples that I was going to walk through for this is if you have, um, let's say, a medical procedure that is getting recorded as an event on the blockchain because all these doctors and hospitals want to see your medical records, that medical procedure may have to trigger an insurance policy, and that insurance policy might be a piece of software on another blockchain, and that insurance policy, after verifying that you recovered, might have to trigger a payment, and that payment might be on the whatever. So all of a sudden you have transaction leaving a blockchain, arriving in another blockchain, processing a transaction, leaving that blockchain and arriving in a third blockchain. These types of systems and these types of use cases we think are going to be more and more common. So that's where we start to see the, the need for like domain-specific blockchains emerging. A uh, quick high-level view of the architecture of what we're building. Uh, the Aon network is something that's been in development uh, by our, our core team for a few years now. Uh, we're about, give or take, a month away from launching this as a live network. It's, it's available today as a test network. You can jump in and test it out if you're a developer. Um, this is kind of the operating system and routing layer. And then everything that sits around it is what we call these bridges that connect into one of three different types of networks, either an existing public network, private network, or Aon spoke network. Um, public networks, obviously Bitcoin, Ethereum, private ne to networks, this is where we connect to things like Hyperledger and R3 and others. And then anybody who uses the same DNA or the same code base to kind of launch their own system. And we see this kind of eventually emerge, like transforming into more of a spider web rather than a hub and spoke, where these networks can also become connecting to other networks and so on and so forth. Uh, at some point, though, the purpose of this is that all of this is unknown to the user. And, you know, when we joke, we say, um, you know, we'll know that blockchains have reached ubiquitous kind of adoption when it's just as boring to talk about blockchains as it is to talk about databases. And nobody likes to talk about databases. It's not an exciting thing that draws 100 people to a room. But so that's when the industry will have succeeded in our minds and nobody wants to talk about what we're doing anymore because it'll be so buried between behind layers and layers of technology that you will have no idea what's going on just like you don't need to understand the functions of TCP IP to log in and use the internet. 
And that's where we want to see this technology evolve to. Uh, but this kind of gives you a broad picture of how we see the, the industry emerging. Uh, five basic kind of actors or users in the system. Uh, up here, kind of, I'd say developers and or adopters. And then down here, kind of um, network security uh, providers. So at, at the top layer, we've got kind of three buckets that we work with actively today. Uh, the startup bucket is really uh, mostly focused on existing startups that have built existing businesses on other technology stacks. So we're dealing with a lot of web-based infrastructure companies that are working on, um, you know, fintech applications or health tech applications, all that are built on kind of traditional web-based stacks that are realizing that decentralized architectures might actually unlock a new layer of their application that they didn't think about before. Uh, you know, a simple example, we're working with a small business lending company in North America that's very popular and successful that realizes that they can convert their small business lending marketplace into a into a peer-to-peer -peer bond marketplace if they transfer over and transition over to a blockchain. So working with companies like this means we need to develop tools that are familiar to them, tools that don't look all that different from the way they would have built software on their old technologies so that they can migrate efficiently without having to kind of learn what consensus algorithms are necessarily. And that's kind of one of the intentions. Enterprises are a group that's spending you know, millions and millions of dollars learning about this. Every major bank in the world, every major insurance company, every government in any notable country in the world is spending millions and millions of dollars researching and experimenting with this technology for good reason. I mean, in China, it's particularly interesting because of the obvious controversy between centralization and centralization, or decentralization and centralization. But they're still very curious. The Central Bank of China is still talking about digitally issued currencies that would sit on top of a government-backed blockchain of some sort. And there's going to be use cases for things like that. Uh, so these companies and governments and large institutions also need kind of hand-holding through the process because they're not typically the ones to unlock it, breakthroughs in technology with things like this. So we've, we've got a lot of clients that we work with in this space um, and then finally, the DAP developer, for those of you unfamiliar with that term, this, the D kind of stands for decentralized app. So this is a term that's kind of been coined by the industry. Most of these people are building Bitcoin apps or, or Ethereum apps, or increasingly, if you're in China, you're probably working with technologies like Quantum or Neo. Um, but what we don't like about the current model is the current model is very much like what enterprises call vendor lock-in, right? You pick a technology and you get stuck on it whether you like it or not, because you've built so many dependencies on that technology. And from an application perspective, what we don't think is the right answer is that I happen to choose the wrong blockchain, therefore my business fails because the blockchain I built on fails. And that's the reality today. You build a blockchain, you build an app on the wrong blockchain, and as that blockchain loses relevance, your app loses relevance. And we think that there's probably a better way to architect from an application perspective so that applications can get built natively on multiple networks their logic can be redeployed seamlessly across multiple networks, and they can reduce some of that risk of picking the wrong blockchain when they're building their business. And that's uh, so that there's there's an, a, a large kind of push towards rethinking what's the pitch to the to the average app developer in this industry. There tends to be a lot of kind of religious turf war in this industry. Like if you're a Bitcoin believer and Ethereum believer, you might hate each other. Um, and so we're trying to kind of break through that a little bit and, and have a little bit more of a pragmatic conversation. But and then finally at, at the at the infrastructure layer, this is really what makes these networks tick. If you're unfamiliar with the blockchain space, what's different here is you're not paying Google or Alibaba to host your data. You're paying a network of thousands, if not tens of thousands, and maybe eventually millions of random people to manage and process and secure the system on which you're operating. And they do that for financial reward, right? They do that because they're miners or they're, they're getting some sort of payment out of the system. And that's what's really kind of unique about this, is this is a, a completely new economic model that moves away from the dependency we have on these massive tech behemoths. So the validator is the person providing kind of hardware to the system, the person who runs miners in the Bitcoin system. Uh, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about how we design our consensus for these people, but very critically important in the security of the system. And finally, the bridge builder is that, is that server or that node that operates at the intersection of two blockchains in our design. And we've designed it in such a way that it's a decentralized process where multiple nodes, multiple servers can operate that same function to be able to prove events that happen on one blockchain and transmit those events to another blockchain and get financially incentivized for doing that. So all of this is kind of the moving pieces uh, that we're in the process of building. And again, I've jumped again because this is all the same information. Um, 
So a couple of example use cases, just to give you some context as to like where this might go. And we're talking to, we have a couple of projects that are now in the process of developing applications on top of Aon as we get ready for our first release. Uh, but if you're into the cryptocurrency space, if you trade, if you're like into these, these use cases, obviously decentralized exchanges are becoming more and more and more relevant, especially if you live in a country where centralized exchanges have been shut down in the last six months. We won't name any countries, but um, so this is becoming really important, and there's a lot of interesting use cases coming around around how you build autonomously managed software that can actually be shut down. Um, the problem today is decentralized exchanges in their current form, again, are tied to a single blockchain. So you might have a decentralized exchange like Ether Delta, for example, that allows you to trade any asset that sits on top of Ethereum, which is one blockchain, because it's connected to that one blockchain. There does not exist an efficient way to decentralize exchanges between blockchains. And so that's a use case that we think might emerge on top of Aon. Hybrid public and private blockchain use cases. This is kind of the example of like, you know, that health data insurance and payment <laughs> use case I was, I was talking about. Um, and then decentralized applications that span across multiple blockchains. Um, are, are any of you familiar with the uh, a blockchain project called Bancor? Relatively popular, um, big Israeli company. Uh, they raised, I think, $150 million last year. Um, they have a system that they built on top of Ethereum, and part of their roadmap was to redeploy that system on top of many networks to make sure that they can unlock the features of what they're building, and I won't go into what they're building, but on top of multiple networks to get access to more and more user base. Um, so we're working with Bancor to, to essentially redeploy Bancor on top of Aon and allow the Aon Bridge to redeploy Bancor on top of any other network that uses Bancor Bridge or Aon Bridge technology to connect. So that you can have an app that really is, you know, detached from a single blockchain. And then finally, scaling solution for public networks. We're seeing a lot of interest here. If you want to run an app on Ethereum and you know that your transaction is going to break the system, then you may process all of your transactions on another network and then just bring back kind of the final state of whatever that transaction output was. Uh, so, you know, simple example, big ICOs today, if you run a big, you know, fundraiser on top of Ethereum, a uh, big one last year that kind of did this was an ICO called Status, where in a single day, Status raised, I, I don't remember the amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, $150 million, something crazy. And again, that single event broke the network because that $150 million was thousands and thousands and thousands of microtransactions hitting the network in a very short window of time where they could have run their ICO on another network and simply brought back the final version or the final state, the final ledger of who owns their coins which would have been a significantly more efficient use of the Ethereum network and cheaper for the application developers because using these networks is becoming increasingly expensive. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chris, who's going to talk to us a little bit about our roadmap. If you're a developer, you hopefully find this interesting, and then we'll dive into a few of these pieces. Thanks, Matt. Um, so my name is Chris, and I'm one of the uh, engineer for Aeon. So here's our roadmap about who we can approach from 2018 to 2019. So so far right now we are on the Aeon phase one right now. So you will see we are attempt to achieve in the fast VM with event source compatibility. So for right now. Uh, as benchmark right now, we're showing this morning the price performance of uh, EVM. And also, we are we are also testing our functional token bridge. So, uh, if you guys have, well, so I will give, uh, so information will be listed on our GitHub. Yes, and then also we are attempting to modify the proof of work consensus and the algorithm. So, now we are on the face of the Aon testnet, um, and also we are we are going to release the uh, Aon virtual machine technical paper. So about the uh, so as long the uh, there's no street blocking way the uh, relation to the account um, to achieve that, which means Aon needs to define uh, its own uh, virtual machine language. Um, Yeah, so for uh, for more detailed information, pretty much, uh, um, I would say people can visit our GitHub uh, web paper. Yeah, so for uh, 
<laughs> oh yeah, so this is actually the, the process from right now we are testing as well. So we are testing the, uh, the token bridge protocol from Ethereum to the yeah. Um, Uh, yes, so this is actually the component that will be involving for uh, the, uh, the bridge module with uh, will be uh, this is our the, the 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 key component for currently designed the bridge. So including the fee, uh, how uh, the, the 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 transition uh, sorry the, the the transfer fee and the hashing algorithm and and also identify the uh, the protocol from network to the network and the address and the data signature. Yes, this is the page we're virtualizing right now. We are testing is from Ethereum. So the uh, and it's from the, the transition from Ethereum. Know how it can cross our uh, our desired uh, consensus bridge. Uh, 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 our bridge nodes uh, network with desired consensus, and then the transaction transition will be led into our air network. I can target this job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, just quickly for those of you who follow uh, or are interested in the monetary supply, um, so um, there's, I think the number is actually wrong, it should be 4.65, but there's uh, our monetary supply right now is all on Ethereum. So just to what Chris was talking about on the last slide, the purpose of our first bridge is we have a token operating on the Ethereum network that we're going to be migrating its supply over to the Aon network. Uh, but we'll be the first to do it in such a way where it's a decentralized swap process. Because uh, if you followed other projects, generally what that's meant is they've launched the token and then at some point they've required that you send the token back to them and then they send you a coin and they kind of centralize that conversion process. So part of our design is actually to be able to create kind of a, uh, a decentralized consensus process where somebody can prove that you own a token, burn your token, and then issue you a coin. Uh, but built into the protocol rather than having kind of a centralized function to do that. Um, so with that, the purpose is that we have 465 million tokens sitting on Ethereum. And that's the supply that's supposed to be on Aeon. So that's why we built essentially um, the, the migration over uses the bridge. And then after the migration happens, the bridge start or the, the Aeon network starts to, to reward validators. And it rewards validators on a 1% annual inflation monetary policy. So that's what this is trying to reflect. There'll be a scale up in the first month of that rewarding and then it'll end up rewarding. Uh, it ends up being, uh, I think it's roughly at today's block time, it's roughly 1.5 Aon per block. Uh, and you know, for those of you interested in kind of testing out the functions of kind of like pseudo mining, uh, you can jump into our test network and see what that feels like. And we're about a month away from the network being live where this will be like a, a live reward with live value. Um, so keep in mind, or keep up uh, with our social media to hear about the effective announcement of that. Chris, do you want to talk about our Equihash uh, mining algorithm? Okay. Okay, so uh, for Aon, so we currently we are using the Equihash 210 so which is actually our modified version of the uh, Equihash uh, 210, uh, sorry, 200, to receive, uh, to achieving more uh, acid resistance, because there's a memory, uh, so it's actually increased the acid resistance uh, due to the VR custom, uh, based on our algorithm, we'll get more memory usage for a GPU. Um, also, it's about um, diversified uh, Equihash parameters. So, and also on our GitHub, and we released the single mining pool. So basically you can try on our mining pool attached to the AM uh, uh, binary. And a trial, uh, it's actually a strengthen, uh, strengthen, uh, uh, it's, it's a strengthen protocol compatible to connect to any, uh, um, using your own GPU to mine with our single pool, uh, single pool. So, and if it is a single pool, so it's actually a single address pair. Um, we will actually, we are actually, we have our internal team is actually under development for the public mining pool. So we actually encourage that people can, 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 can look at our GitHub and, and do your contribution to the, uh, our, um, code base. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, this is just for, for those of you who are developers who want to jump in and learn a little bit more. Um, and we're re-releasing the website in a couple weeks, which will break down a lot of this in more detail. 
Uh, but check out our GitHub. I think we've got a slide. Uh, yeah, so github.com slash AI network. Uh, we got an active developer forum if you're a developer and you want to learn and chat with our developers. Uh, you know, before we kind of wrap up and take questions, though, uh, this is what our team looks like a couple weeks ago. I think it's grown by a few since then. Um, but just to kind of close off with what the purpose of what we're talking about is, and this is, again, back to this idea of, uh, you know, what we think the future of decentralized internets look like. Um, and right now, we know that there's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of blockchain projects around the world being developed. We think probably 95% of them will probably not see the next two years. Maybe we're one of those. Who knows? There's a lot of risk launching a new project like this. But you know, what is relevant is we do believe that there's going to be multiple protocols that, that are uh, well adopted at some point in the future. So the analogy often in this industry is kind of like, um, you know, are you going to be VHS tapes or Betamax tapes, but we don't really see it that simply. We think that there will be space for multiple protocols that are designed for kind of different purposes. Some protocols are being designed to optimize, you know, microtransactions among IoT devices. And that's a very different requirement than the designs like Bitcoin that are like large value transfer systems. And we think that, you know, for all of these things to coexist, a system like Aon is absolutely necessary. Um, and, you know, by the way, what we're doing with Aon is also being done very much in collaboration with not only the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, but also with our partners in other interoperability projects. So whether, you know, this comes out in, in the future as something under a different name, the thought is that we're all contributing kind of relevant research to this important problem that needs to be solved for us to really see, you know, what the future state of this industry might look like. Um, there's a lot, if, you know, I don't want to get too much into the philosophy of why we do this and, you know, some of the social benefits of, of a technology like this. But the more we travel, the more we realize that in different parts of the world, there's different reasons why people are getting excited about this. And that's why, you know, to us, it's a really interesting time to be in the industry because you've got a lot of different motivations. You know, we talk to mining groups that are in it for the profit, and it's important because they're securing the system. And we, you know, we spent some time in South Africa and Kenya last month, and we realized that, you know, there it's about financial inclusion because banking systems have been ineffective at reaching populations that have internet but don't have banks. Um, you know, so all of these things are all, people are seeing what they want out of the blockchain because this is a technology that really has the potential to reshape how we build industries. Um, it's it's a, an opportunity for us to essentially rebuild with infrastructure that is nearly provided for free. And what's different about this, when we think about financial services, we talk to, I talk to a lot of banks about this problem. They say, well, why should this be concerning to us as a bank? And you know, my simple perspective on it has, all, has always been that banks have maintained competitive advantage because they sit on billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure, which essentially creates a massive barrier to entry for anybody else. Because unless you can afford billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure, you can't effectively compete with a bank. Until somebody provides to you a public utility that can be used nearly for free, that replicates all of the features of banking infrastructure, but better. And all of a sudden now I can build apps like payment apps and remittance apps and investment apps and insurance apps without any infrastructure requirement. And I can directly compete on incremental pieces what a bank does. And if a bank's not worried about that, it's because they're not reading enough about this. And uh, you know, this is not an Aon thing, this is the industry in general, but it's important that we kind of remind ourselves why we're doing this. I think the biggest criticism we have of the industry we're very insular and we're very bubble-like. We talk to each other about why we're all so smart and why we all have great technical expertise, but we forget that this is really something that's being designed for the rest of the world who doesn't live in the blockchain industry on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and part of that is understanding you know, the benefits to places in the world with no infrastructure, places in the world with no financial systems, uh, and places in the world that do have these systems, but that have them in, in you know, overly um, you know, controlled and uh, uh, maybe censored ways. Um, again, not to name any specific countries, but uh, so that's why you know we do what we do. Um, I'll stop there. Happy to take any questions in English or in Chinese if you have questions on the tech. Um, you know, we, we probably could have jumped into some sort of little demo, but we'll uh, we'll we'll see if anybody's got any specific questions. Thank you. Yeah. In English or Chinese? In English. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you said um, if somebody wants to build an application that's on Ethereum and Ethereum crashes down or whatever, then you cannot build their application anymore. Right? Basically.
because they could always port the code and redeploy it somewhere else. It's just, you know, you end up tying a user base and kind of a, a piece of your success that's tied to the entire